Deanna Ross and her father were the last people to see 12-year-old Janelle Matthews alive when they dropped her off at home after a school Christmas concert. She was never seen alive again until almost 40 years later when a construction worker made a grisly discovery in a field that he was working in. Finally, justice came knocking on the door of the man who stole Christmas back in 1984. Come with me as we talk about the heartbreaking and tragic abduction and subsequent murder of 12-year-old Janelle Matthews. Hi guys, welcome to Sunny's Mysterious Stories. I just want to quickly introduce you to my best fair friend, Sonny. He's the inspiration for the name of this channel and I'm hoping to bring him onto camera a little bit more, but he is very camera shy. And me, well, I'm just known as Sonny's Dad. This, everyone, is Sonny. He's actually feeling a little bit poorly at the moment. He's got an abscess and he's going to the dentist on Friday to have some teeth taken out. Aren't you, baby? But Sonny says hello, and he might see you later. Hey, baby. Bye-bye. Good boy. So this is a brand new channel, so once again, welcome. This is the second episode, so if you haven't seen the first video, please go and have a look at that at the end of this one. Well, each week I intend on bringing you some of the very best in true crime, both solved and unsolved, from around the world. Hopefully it will be stories that you've never heard of before and if you have then I'm hoping to bring a new twist to it. I'll be talking of stories that predominantly cover murders, love triangles and of course some of the very worst serial killers that have ever walked this earth. Sprinkled in with these will also be some stories from the world of the paranormal so hopefully there will be a little something for everyone. So if you like this sort of content why don't you sit back and relax and join us as we go on a journey to the darker and weirder side of life. So we're going to start today's story off in September of 1968 when Jim and Gloria Matthews welcomed their daughter Jennifer into the world. Now Jim and Gloria had an idea of what their perfect family should look like and it included more than just one child. The sad thing was that after having given birth to Jennifer, Gloria and Jim found it increasingly difficult to conceive again. But not once to sit around and let that disappointment fester for too long, they came to the conclusion that there were so many children out there that needed to be adopted. At this time in their lives, they were living in Camarillo in California, which if you didn't know, is about an hour north of Los Angeles. So they decided to explore the possibility of adoption with the Children's Home Society in California, which had one of their offices in nearby Santa Barbara. Now around this time, in February 9th, 1972, a young 13-year-old girl called Terry Vieira Martinez gave birth to a healthy baby girl at Cottage Hospital in the city of Santa Barbara. The young mother tried her absolute best to raise her daughter, but within a month of the baby's birth, she realised that she just wasn't able to take care of a small baby. After all, she was still just a baby herself, being only 13 years old. So by the end of March 1972, Terry put her young baby girl up for adoption. She desperately hoped that by doing this, it would give her a decent chance for a better life than what she would have had with just herself. So now we go back to Jim and Gloria. You see, while they were going through the adoption process, Jim, who happened to be a lifelong educator, was given the opportunity to teach overseas in Beirut of all places. So, because of this, the Children's Home Society actually accelerated their application process. And by March of 1972, just a mere six weeks after Terry gave birth to Janelle, the little baby girl became a member of the Matthews family. Gloria had said that back in those days, adoption agencies tried to match the best children to their new parents. 
so Jennifer, their first biological child, had light hair just like her father. And Janelle had dark hair just like Gloria. So Janelle looked like she was just a regular member of the family. Now, after having taught for three years in Beirut, Jim Matthews and his family returned to California. Then in 1978, Jim accepted a new job as Director of Development at Dayspring Christian Academy and relocated his family to a place called Greeley, which is located in the high plains of northern Colorado, which is about 25 miles east of the Rocky Mountains and north of Denver. The Matthews did their best to raise Janelle to become strong and independent. At times her assertiveness was mistaken for cheekiness, but anyone who knew the young girl knew her to be one highly intelligent 12 year old girl. One of the things that stood out about her was that she seemed as though she always had big plans. To Janelle, any kind of event was always seen as a big deal. As the holiday season approaches in 1984, Janelle was, as she always was at this time of the year, very excited. She was looking forward to spending a lot of time with some of her friends and different family members. But unfortunately, even during the holiday season, evil refuses to take a personal day. Now, the Franklin Middle School, where Janelle and Jennifer were enrolled, had been preparing for their annual Christmas concert. It was something that Janelle had been looking forward to as she'd been chosen to perform in it. But Janelle had become ill with a bad case of a cold just a few days before the concert. The thing was, Janelle was not going to let a thing like a common cold stop her from attending. By December 20th, just mere hours before the concert, Janelle begged and pleaded with her parents to let her go to school that day. I mean, most kids that age would love to have time off school, but not Janelle. She was desperate to go to school. She managed to convince her parents that she would be okay and that she would take things easy. Besides, she had to go to school, she told her parents, and it wasn't just so she could take part in the concert. It was also so that she could hand out the Christmas presents that she had brought for her friends, especially since she wouldn't be seeing most of them for the next few weeks. So, the Matthews gave in and allowed her to go to school and attend the concert, all on the condition that she would come straight home afterwards to rest. After all, she was still a little sick, and Jim and Gloria didn't want Janelle to be ill over the Christmas period. The really sad thing was that neither Jim nor Gloria would be able to attend the school concert after all. You see, Jim had already promised his time to his older daughter Jennifer, who had an important basketball game that night. And then we have Gloria, who would be leaving town that night, as she had to go and look after her mother, who had fallen ill halfway across the country. Even though Janelle's parents were unable to go to the concert to watch their daughter perform, she was over the moon with happiness. Before the start of the concert, Janelle met up with one of her best friends called Deanna Ross. Deanna told Janelle that her father, Russell Ross, would be more than happy to take Janelle and drop her off at home after the concert. As far as anyone knows, Janelle had an absolutely wonderful time at the concert and it seemed that it was just about everything that she had hoped it would be. So as Russell Ross drove Janelle home, she and Deanna talked about the evening's events and the day as a whole. They also went over the plans that they had made for the rest of the Christmas holiday. For Janelle, that was the perfect end to what had been, for her at least, a perfect day. The two girls said goodbye with big hugs as Deanna's dad pulled up to outside Janelle's house. As the father and daughter watched, Janelle let herself into the house. The time was about 8.15pm. Little did they know, but they would be the last people to see Janelle Matthews alive. At 8.30pm, Telephone records have shown that Janelle had answered a call, seemingly for her father. If you remember, Jim Matthews was an educator. In fact, he was the principal at an elementary school. One of his teachers was calling to inform him that he was not going to be able to make it to work the next day. This is believed to be the last time that anyone ever spoke to Janelle. 
except of course for one other. Sometime after that telephone call, Janelle made herself comfortable in her favourite spot on the sofa next to the beautifully decorated Christmas tree with a bowl of popcorn. At around 9.30, just over an hour after Janelle had made it home, her father arrived home to an empty house. Now this was not something that was necessarily unusual in and of itself. Jim Matthews just assumed that Janelle had stayed out later than was planned or agreed to with either himself or Janelle's mother. As Jim stepped into the living room straight away, he noticed three things. One, the heater was on with no one there to benefit from its warmth. Two, Janelle's favorite shawl was strewn on the sofa as if she had just only taken it off. Lastly, a pair of Janelle's shoes were positioned perfectly in front of her favorite spot. The only thing that was missing from this picture was Janelle herself. Remaining calm, Jim quickly made a search of the rest of the house for Janelle. He could find no sign of her. Just as he was finishing his search, he heard the front door open, then close, and as he rushed downstairs to chastise Janelle for going against her parents' wishes, his heart sank when he found that it was his oldest daughter, Jennifer, home after her basketball game. It was now coming to 10 p.m. Totally unaware of her father's panic, when questioned, she told her father that she had not seen her sister all night long. Upon hearing this, Jim Matthews knew in his heart that something was terribly wrong. Jim dialed 911 and reported that his youngest daughter was missing. Within 15 minutes of receiving his telephone call, the greedy police arrived at the Matthews home. What with the winter weather setting in, a missing child was more than enough to get them jumping into action. The moment they arrived at the scene, the Greeley police officers began to conduct a search of the interior and exterior of the Matthews premises, finding absolutely no evidence whatsoever of any kind of struggle or any sign of a forced entry. It left them to contemplate the idea that Janelle may have left off on her own accord, even though it seemed like she had left without a jacket or her shoes, especially considering that it had been snowing and more was on its way. Jim tried his best to assure the police officers that his 12 year old daughter would not have gotten very far in bare feet and in the snow. Okay, so get this. After having taken a closer look at the outside of the Matthews property, the police did actually find one thing that they thought was extremely odd. There was a set of footprints in the snow around the living room window and the footprints were too big to be Janelle's. It left the police to believe that an unknown person could possibly have been watching Janelle from outside. But despite these suspicious footprints, the police continued with their first theory that Janelle had more than likely run away from home for some unknown reason. That led them to issue a summary of her disappearance. Desperate for the police to look at other avenues, Janelle's father tried in vain to reiterate that running away from home was just not a possibility for his daughter. He told them of the many plans that Janelle had made for the Christmas break. They were expecting one of her close girlfriends to come and have a sleepover the very next night. And there was the Christmas presentation at the church that they, she was involved in. Running away from home just didn't make any sense to Janelle's father. To be fair, the police did take on board everything that Jim Matthews tried telling them, but frustratingly to him, they continued to investigate the young girl's disappearance from the perspective of a teenage girl who had run away from home. So, the police made a thorough search of her bedroom and her locker at school, hoping that they might find some kind of lead that would assist them in the notion that she would run away, but they found absolutely nothing that could help them. This came as no surprise to Janelle's parents and her sister, and the theory that she was a runaway proved even more unlikely when Janelle failed to either return home or show up anywhere else. This is when the police decided to look at the idea that somebody had possibly abducted Janelle from her home, and the person that they decided to investigate was none other than Terry Vieira Martinez, Janelle's birth mother. 
So as some of you may already know, when a mother or father decides to give up their baby for adoption, it isn't beyond the realm of possibility for them to, at some point in the future, try and reach out and contact their biological child, even after decades in some cases. So for a considerable number of weeks after the police located Janelle's biological mother, they covertly followed her. Their hope was that she would lead them to signs that would show she was responsible for the teenager's disappearance. Jim, Gloria and Jennifer Matthews were understandably terrified that something awful may have happened to Janelle. Although they understood the reasons why the police would suspect Janelle's biological mother, they didn't think that it had much merit as the young woman had never even tried to make any sort of contact with Janelle. Naturally, the only suspect that they seemed to have turned out to be a dead end. There was no real shock there. To Jim, it seemed as though they were taking their time trying to find other avenues of inquiry. Of course, they held interviews with family, friends and anyone else who might have been at the Matthews home in the days leading up to the girl's disappearance, but that line of inquiry led absolutely nowhere. The thing was that Janelle wasn't the only missing person case that they had in their books. In the 70s and 80s, it has been estimated that well over 1 million children went missing every year. That really blew my mind when I heard that stat over one million missing children every friggin' year. I mean, I just find it difficult to comprehend that number of children going missing. It really just blows my mind. So anyway, with no viable leads to help with their investigation, it wasn't too long before they turned their attention to Janelle's father, Jim Matthews. Again, as some of you may already know, in pretty much most cases like this one, the police will always turn their attention to family members, if only to rule them out of the investigation. But that being said, you can imagine how it would feel to have one of your loved ones go missing, or God forbid, murdered. Now, you know that you had nothing to do with it, and to your mind, the police would be wasting their time. And while they were interrogating you, they weren't doing anything to follow real leads. You'd be thinking, what the frig are they doing? For months, the police placed all their attention on poor old Jim. At one point, they even came right out with it and outright accused him of being involved in their daughter's disappearance. To be fair, Jim was reported as saying that he understood that they were just trying to do their jobs and because of this, he cooperated completely with their investigation. He went even as far as to sit for a polygraph test. This was done by a member of the FBI instead of a police officer. The thing was though, according to the FBI, Jim failed the polygraph test. Now you see, this is when Jim really lost his shit. Angrily, he told them that he had been nothing but completely honest with them, that he had made himself totally accessible to them whenever they needed to speak to him, but now he was sick to death of it all. It wasn't until late February of 1985 that the police and the FBI officially cleared Jim Matthews of any part of his daughter's disappearance. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's great that they finally cleared his name, but what took them so long and what was it that changed their minds? About a month after Janelle went missing, a 24-hour prayer vigil was held at her honour at Greeley Church. It was the same church that the Matthews attended and where Janelle was going to be participating in the Christmas presentation. Whilst the police seemed to have other avenues to go down in the search for Janelle, the Matthews decided to put their faith into the power of prayer. Their faith had remained strong ever since Janelle went missing and it never seemed to waver, even after everything that they had been through. Reporters attended the vigil and the message that the Matthews had for them was that they were going to continue to hang out for hope and belief that Janelle was still very much alive and that they would eventually be reunited with one another and that she would be unharmed. But the months passed by with not a word. In March 1985, the then president, Ronald Reagan, made mention in a speech of the number of children that went missing in America each year. Remember the stats that I told you about earlier? Over 1 million missing children every year between the 70s and 80s? Even back then in 1985, 
The president had a good understanding of the power of the media and he used that understanding when he pleaded with journalists up and down the country to use whatever resources they had at their disposal to help the authorities in finding some of these missing kids. The president even mentioned Janelle by name, but despite his personal plea, the case went stone cold. Well over a million American children disappear from their homes or neighborhoods every year causing, as we can all understand, heartbreaking anguish. For example, I learned about Jonelle Matthews of Greeley, Colorado, who would have celebrated a happy 13th birthday with her family just last month. But five days before Christmas, Jonelle disappeared from her home. At one point, some partial remains were discovered, but they did not lead anywhere. The remains did not belong to Jonelle Matthews. And although those remains did not belong to Janelle, and the Matthews felt great relief at that, it started to become painfully obvious that the investigation had come to a standstill once again. And for a long, long time to come, this is how it remained. After 10 long years went by without knowing if Janelle was dead or alive, with heartbreak, the Matthews had Janelle officially declared dead. To be honest, they really just needed some kind of closure for their family. It seemed to them that they would never get truly it seemed to them that they would never truly get the answers that they so desperately longed for. Continuing to stay in Greeley proved to be far too painful for Jim and Gloria Matthews, so they decided to retire and move to Costa Rica, while Janelle's older sister, Jennifer, moved to Washington to attend university. And then 35 years after Janelle went missing in July 2019, her case was finally smashed wide open. You see, there's a part of Greeley on the southeastern side of Colorado. Some construction workers were digging in the land as part of an oil and gas pipeline job when they made a grisly discovery. They found a set of human skeletal remains. It was in a spot that was approximately 15 miles southeast of the Matthews old home. As per standard procedures, DNA and other analytical investigations took place and after some time it was determined that the remains did in fact belong to missing 12 year old Janelle Matthews. And because of these findings, two particularly important things could now take place. Firstly, Janelle's family could finally now come to terms with what had happened to her. And secondly, the police would now be able to determine exactly just how Janelle Matthews had indeed died. As you can maybe imagine, after 30 years of being buried in the ground, well, it had not been kind, and even though Janelle's body had almost completely decomposed, there was one thing about her remains that was painfully obvious there was a single bullet hole in what remained of her skull. As the Matthews family came back to Greeley so that they could finally put their daughter to rest, the police investigation began to heat up in earnest. On September 13th, 2019, the ship really hit the fan as the Greeley Police Department announced that they did in fact have a person of interest in the kidnap and subsequent murder of Janelle Matthews but boy oh boy, the person of interest that they seemed to have set their sights on was in fact a man that they had secretly suspected for over 30 years. Even during the time when they had been turning Jim Matthews' life upside down with their false accusations, all that time the Matthews family and friends grieved, not knowing how their beloved daughter and sister and friend had died, they had suspected this particular man all along but obviously they couldn't prove it, and so they had remained silent. So this is the part of the heartbreaking story where I introduce you to a very despicable man, Steve Pankey. Pankey was by no means a nobody. He was actually a fairly well-known and pretty influential man who in 2014 and 2018 had run for the governorship of Idaho. Before that, he had unsuccessfully run for the position of Lieutenant Governor in 2010. 
In total, he had run a total of seven times for various positions in the state of Idaho. Scarily, three of those attempts for power had been for the position of county sheriff. And how, as far as I'm concerned, that is scary as hell. I mean, could you imagine what it could have been like if he had become the county sheriff? How freaking scary would that have been? Especially when it comes to the investigation into Janelle Matthews' disappearance. As it turns out, at the time of Janelle's disappearance, Panky used to live less than two miles from the Matthews family home. He had made the claim that he had been a youth pastor at the very same church that the Matthews had attended, the same church that Janelle would have sung in that Christmas. But he had left the church just prior to the Matthews joining. His leaving the church had been something to do with an alleged sexual assault of some type. And as it actually turned out, after a little investigating, it was discovered that he was never a church pastor. He was in fact just the janitor. Over the intervening years, Panky had tried his best to insert himself into Janelle's missing persons case. Not just a few times either, but several times. He had even volunteered, without ever having been asked, what he claims were details about when Janelle had died. Just mere weeks after Janelle went missing, Panky had contacted the FBI with what he claimed was information that would help solve the case. It was reported that in return for this information, he wanted total immunity for himself. But ask yourself this, if you are totally innocent of any crime, then why on earth would you feel the need for immunity? But not just any old immunity, he wanted total immunity. I'll let that just sit with you for a little while. Okay, so one of the most damning things about this case for me is something that I haven't told you about yet, and that is this. Panky knew that whoever was responsible for kidnapping and murdering Janelle Matthews had used a rake to cover up the majority of the footprints that was left in the snow outside the house on the night she disappeared. You remember the footprints left in the snow that I told you about early on? The ones that led up to the living room window that the police found? Hmm? The information about the footprints being partially raked over, well, that little bit of information was something that had been kept from the public. It was a detail that only the police detectives and the Matthews knew about. And of course, the person who abducted and then went on to murder Janelle, they knew about it too. It was the fact that Panky knew this piece of information that initially made him a possible suspect for the police investigation. But beyond that, the police had no probable cause to fully investigate him at the time. Now you see, this is something that I really don't understand. In my mind, surely knowing about the raped snow would give you more than probable cause. But then again, I'm not an American, so I don't understand all the ins and outs of American law. Maybe one of you lovely viewers can fill me in a little bit down in the comments section. I would really appreciate learning a little something about how it really works. Before I carry on, I should tell you a little something about Steve Pankey. So, he was born in 1951 in Ventura, California. His father was a Youth for Christ leader and Pankey claimed that he came from a family with a long history of homosexuals and hellfire and brimstone Baptists. I really couldn't find much on his mother and to be honest she doesn't feature in this tale anyhow. So in 1975 he enlisted in the US Army but precisely one year later he was discharged. Rumour has it that his discharge may possibly have been due to homosexual activities because not too long after his release it's been said that he made the claim that he had left the gay lifestyle and was going to spend some time repenting for it. So as far as can be made out, Panky was an absolutely terrible husband who was cruel, controlling and abusive and that he wouldn't even allow his wife to see her family. She wasn't allowed to drive a car or even watch TV or listen to the radio. In fact, TVs, newspapers and radio were strictly forbidden in the Panky household. His wife was also ordered not to go through any of his things or his business.
had a wonderful Christmas with my parents. On December 26, 1984, uh, six days later, we were returning, and when we got back into, uh, in the evening time in, in Colorado, uh, we heard on the news that a missing, there was a missing girl uh, then. That was my first knowledge of it. Now, Panky claimed that he and his wife were at home the night that Janelle was abducted and that they were planning for a little trip out of town that very next day. He claimed that his wife would verify everything he was telling them. Now you see, the police detectives felt as though the statements that Panky were making were not only false, but that the details he was giving them in connection with the trip were somewhat superfluous. It was because of this that they felt it vitally important that they actually speak to his now ex-wife, Angela Hicks, just as he had offered. Believe me when I tell you that the story she conveyed to the police absolutely destroyed her ex-husband's alibi. So this is how it really went down. A few days before Janelle went missing, Panky's parents invited him and his family to join them in Big Bear in California for the Christmas holidays, which under normal circumstances would sound great. But Steve Panky and his parents were almost totally estranged and they didn't really think that he would accept the invitation. In fact, Steve had told his wife that they would not be going. But after Janelle went missing on December 20th, he all of a sudden changed his mind and with basically no warning, he told her to pack as they would be going to his parents after all. Not only did his wife have to pack two bags for the two of them and two for the kids, but they also had two huge Great Danes named Marble and Butch. When she inquired about the arrangements for the two dogs, he simply told her, rather cruelly, that she needn't worry about the dogs, as they were gone. Literally gone. He told his wife that he had dumped the dogs somewhere and he wouldn't tell her where. Angela, his wife, never saw Mabel or Butch ever again which is totally heartbreaking for her. And to this day, nobody is sure of the whereabouts of the dogs. You can only but imagine what he did to those poor things. Anyway, the stay at his parents didn't go too well as Panky ended up having a huge fight with his father over something or another. And so on Christmas Eve, he forced his family back into the family car and they left to make the journey back home to Greeley. During the drive home in silence, the man who forbade his wife and children from listening to the radio ordered Angela to find a news radio station. When she finally tuned in to a radio news broadcast that was talking about the tragic story of a missing 12-year-old girl from Greeley, he told her to stop. He became totally consumed by the story. Even more surprisingly, he pulled up outside a convenience store where he told his wife to buy new, two newspapers. As they continued with their journey home, he made Angela read out loud any article that had made mention of the missing Greeley girl. One of the newspapers was the Denver Post and the other was the Greeley Tribune. Angela remembers that when they eventually got home, he changed into his overalls, grabbed hold of the shovel and told his wife that he needed to fix a problem with their new septic tank. But she knew better than to ask questions, but she did think it rather strange as they had only just recently replaced the septic tank less than a year ago, and as far as she knew, there were no problems with it. Sadly, sometime in 2008, the Panky's son was unexpectedly murdered, and it was at his funeral that Panky was reported to have said something along the lines of how he hoped that God hadn't allowed this to happen to his son because of Janelle Matthews. Angela Hicks did say that she hadn't really thought about it, putting it down to her husband's grief. In hindsight, it seemed to take on a much more sinister connotation. Get this guys, as the investigation gained momentum, Panky realised that the police were seriously considering him as their prime suspect and so he began on a mini press tour. In fact, it seemed as though he couldn't get enough of talking to the press. 
There are a number of incendiary interviews that he gave, some of them whining about how he was being persecuted by the police detectives involved in the case. I will list some of these in the description for you if you want to take a look. But for now, take a look and listen at this short clip of one of the interviews. When you're a parent and you know what happened to your murdered child like me, that's bad enough, okay? You live with it the rest of your life. But if you have a, a young girl and you've got these rumors going out there, possible forced into prison, I mean, that would be a horrible thing for the Matthews to live with. It's a horrible thing for anybody to think about that. So at least they know, I mean, they know for sure that she's gone and they've got her remains, they've buried her with dignity in a cemetery. So I, I am very happy for her. That's when I did the who, why, because, you know, I think, I think getting the United States attorney involved in here. You know, when you're talking about making deals, my relationship with the Greeley police is, it's just in your face all the time, okay? It's either you're crazy and you, I mean, from... On October 9th, 2020, a grand jury finally handed down an eight-page indictment against Steve Pankey. In it, it basically charged that Pankey took Janelle Matthews from her family home during the course of the kidnapping. He shot her in the back of the head. Almost 35 years after she went missing, on October 12th, 2020, Panky was arrested and charged with the kidnapping and first degree murder of 12-year-old Janelle Matthews. In October 2021, Steve Panky's trial began. 71-year-old Panky pleaded not guilty, which didn't really come as any surprise to anyone. His defence attorney tried to claim that there was absolutely no indication that Panky had committed the murders, and again that there was no indication that he had anything to do with the burial of Janelle's body. He claimed that his client had merely wanted to be in the limelight, that he wanted attention. Well, he certainly got his wish, didn't he? Panky, after hearing testimony from several witnesses, including his ex-wife Angela, he decided to take the stand, something that his attorneys did not want him to do. One of the things that he testified to was that in the past he had indeed lied to the authorities about his knowledge of the case. He admitted that he had made a lot of things up out of pure bitterness and that he was just trying to be a big man, just to be in the case. It made me wonder what it was that he felt bitter about and the only thing that I can think of is it refers to how he failed each and every time he tried to run for the seat of Governor of Idaho as well as County Sheriff. When the jury returned their verdicts, he was found guilty of making false reports to the authorities, but when it came to kidnapping and murder counts, they found themselves at a deadlock. The judge had no choice but to declare a mistrial on those counts. Prosecutors in the case didn't waste too much time in announcing that they would be seeking a new trial, and on October 31st, 2022, Panky was found guilty on all counts. He received a sentence of 20 years to life. His earliest possible release date is in 2042. By this time, he could be 91 years old. The journey to 71-year-old Steve Panky being found guilty for the murder of Janelle's Matthew dragged on for nearly four decades. At his sentencing hearing, he said, I am a Christian, I will be in heaven. I am innocent and there is no justice for Janelle. Well guys, that concludes this week's story. I'd love to know what you all thought about it, so why not leave a comment in the comment section down below. I really do hope that you enjoyed this video. I hope I didn't bore you too much. I'm getting to like, I'm just getting into the swing of doing these things. I really do hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, then please remember to hit the like button. And if you haven't already done so, please consider subscribing to the channel with your bell notifications turned on so that you can get notified every time a new video gets uploaded. So until next week guys, please take good care of yourselves and I'll see you all soon. Bye bye.